We are starting a new study uh, tonight. Uh, it's about the attributes of God. What what defines God? Um, what makes Him different? What 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 separates Him from everything else? Uh, and as we go into that tonight, one thing that I want to look at is there's a lot of things in this world. The the let's say the Sistine Chapel, uh, Notre Dame Cathedral that just that just burnt. Um, it's irreplaceable. It's it, it was a one of a kind. There's nothing else. There was no, no other cathedral like the Notre Dame Cathedral, the Sistine Chapel. There's no other ceiling that's painted like the Sistine Chapel. Uh, you, there's all kinds of art exhibits. There's all kinds of sculptures. There's all kinds of you know the Mona Lisa, the 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 David. There's um, the sculptures. They're one of a kind. There's nothing else like them. Now they've made they've made prints and they've made copies, but you know the the Mona Lisa is in in the Louvre in in France, and there's only one of them, and it's 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 considered priceless. Um, you, you couldn't put a price on what what the Mona Lisa would be worth. Uh, if somebody was to ever steal it, they couldn't sell it because there's only one of them and there's 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 no market for it. I mean, there's nobody would. Would, would want to be caught with it. So there's, there, there's so many things in this world that are considered one of a kind. I um, ran across a video one time, and, and I love to watch, have, haven't seen it in a while, I haven't had a chance to, but the Antiques Roadshow. Anybody ever watch the Antiques Roadshow? It's, it's so interesting to watch it, and you see this stuff, and, and some of the stuff that comes across their stage, I'm like, hey, there used to be one of those in my grandma's attic. You know, there used to be, we used to have one of those. And, but there was this one guy that was watching this Antiques Roadshow, and there was this blanket, this Indian blanket that, that was brought on the show, and and his wife looked at him, and, and, and this guy had been, he had had a car wreck, he was disabled, uh, they were about to lose their house, I mean, they were just, they were struggling. And, and he was, he saw this blanket, and his wife said, that looks a lot like the one you've got, that your grandmother had. So he gets it out, and I don't remember if he took it to the Antiques Roadshow or took it to an auction house, but he took it to them, and, and they looked at it, and they, he's like, well, I, you know, I know that one brought like $100,000, and I was, you know, wondering what, if this would be worth something similar or whatever. And they looked at it, and they said, there's no other one like this one. And they estimated it to be like a half million dollars. And, and it's like, we've never seen one like this one come across here. And it was some Navajo blanket. And I've never seen one this detailed, never seen one. They take it to auction, and the guy is just floored because it goes to like a million and a half for this Indian blanket. And I mean, it changed this, changed this man's life, this, this one-of-a-kind blanket that he had that was nearly priceless because no other one had been seen or found like it. And for that reason, he, it, it completely changed his life. Well, when we hear about things like that and we see things uh, that are considered one of a kind, they can be life-changing, they can be life-altering, but there's nothing else as one of a kind as God. Okay? He is, he is one of a... He, he, there's nothing else even close to God. And, and for that reason... We have something that is life changing. We have something that is life altering. We have something that cannot be replicated. It's something that can't be imitated or copied or anything else. Uh, and that is our God. So tonight we're going to start our study in Psalms chapter 99. In Psalms chapter 99, it says, The Lord reigns. Let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubims. Let the earth be moved. The Lord is great in Zion, and He is high above all the people. Let them praise. 
Your greatness and awesome name. He is holy. The king's strength also loves justice. You have established equality. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. He is holy. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called upon his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spoke to them in the cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies and, his, and the ordinances he gave them. You answered them, O Lord our God, you were to them God who forgives, though you, look, you took vengeance on their deeds. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his holy hill, for the Lord our God is holy. So, when we talk about God's attributes and we talk about what, God, what makes him God or what, what separates him as God, number one is he's holy. Okay? Nothing else in this world can claim to be holy without God. Everything in this world that is considered holy, everything in this world that, that is, is established as holy, is only made holy by God. We are made holy by God. We're not holy without God. But because of Him, we can be made holy. Uh, you, the, the Catholics, you know, they have their holy water. They have holy bread. They have holy... It's only holy because it's associated with God. That's the only way anything can be made holy. The tabernacle, the holy tabernacle, was only holy because of God. Now, as we look at this, and we, we start out here and we see that, that God is, um, He reigns. One thing that I want to, to establish and, and want to talk about is people's concept of God. Uh, a lot of people think of God and they think of him kind of like a superman or or something like that he's he's superhuman or he's we can't describe God with anything that is known we you cannot take human attributes to describe God God is not human God is not superhuman God is different now Here's the thing. We are created in God's image, not the other way around. People try to, people try to imagine God as human or as a man or as a, uh, with our attributes. He don't have them. He's, he's not like us. Now you take the Greeks, the Greek and the Romans. You know, they had their gods. They had Zeus and Athena and I don't remember all of them. I mean, we I remember studying them in school and learning, but I can't remember all of them. Apollos and the thing is, they created those gods, and they created those gods, and they named those gods, and they 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 said what those gods were, and they gave those gods their attributes. They, they decided that uh, one God was going to be the God of love and one God was going to be the God of, of uh, war and one God was going to be the, uh, the, the supreme God and that was Zeus. And they, and they, but, but every one of them, they had flaws. Every one of them had, that they were jealous or they were, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, they lusted after, after earthly girls and, and therefore that's why you, like Hercules among mythology, he was supposed to be, I believe it was Zeus had, had fallen in love with a, a, a human girl and, and therefore they had, they had Hercules or something. But the thing is, is those gods were made up by man and, and given human desires. And, and they, were, they, were, they were supposed to have human flaws. And, and so therefore a lot of people when they talk about God, they associate the same way that the Greeks did and they, they act like that, that our God's got flaws or that he has lustly desires. Or he, listen, just because we are made in his image does not make him in our image. 
He don't have our flaws. He don't have our earthly desires. He don't have our worldly desires. Um, there is, uh, he can't be tempted. Okay? We are tempted. We, we, we fall to temptation. God is not. He, he created everything. We, we imagine God as needing to breathe. We imagine God as, you know, as, as a human form. Now, I'm not saying he don't have a human form, but I don't know if he does or not. When, that, you know, the, when we're created in his image, that could be uh, in our spirit. That could be in our, our, our choices that we make. Now, I believe that he does have a human, or not a human, but a, a body, two legs, two arms, because we have descriptions in Revelation. But we're not, other than that, does he need the air to breathe that we do? No. He he don't he don't need the sunlight. He don't need water. He don't need he don't need all those things because he's God. He created everything. He he don't need the things of this world the same as we do. You see, he created this world for us. Everything that we know of that's on this earth that was created for us. He had everything he needed before this earth was created. So he don't need the things of this earth. He don't need us. Okay? We, are, we were created um, to have a relationship with him. We were created, and I know this gets kind of hard to understand sometimes, but we were created for, I mean, he, he, it was a favor to us. It was a blessing to us that he created us so that we could love him. So that we could have a relationship with Him. It was not in His arrogance that He created us to, to worship Him. That, that wasn't the case. He created us so that we could have a relationship with Him that would benefit us. And that, I know that's hard to, hard to kind of get sometimes. But the thing is, as we look at this, um, we see that God is, is not a created being. He's not something that mythology and and I know people that today that truly they believe that that weak minded Christians made up a God so that we could feel better about ourselves there's people that that believe that um, but that's not the case. We had absolutely nothing to do. Humans had nothing to do with creating this world. Humans had nothing to do with creating our God. He created us. Okay, um, and because of that, he reigns. He has he he has the ability to reign, but he has the the right to reign. Uh, when you when a when a country or when a nation has a king that reigns over them, the people of that nation have to give him the right or the ability to reign over them. Um, now, some of them do it by force, but uh, you take like, um, I say the North Koreans. Uh, their, their dictator, he reigns over them. Now, they don't think they have a choice, but the truth of the matter is, if they, up, if, if they had a real uprising, he would no longer be reigning over them. And, and so therefore, all kings and all all leaders that reign, they do so because the people let them, or the leaders, other leaders of the of the of their nation let them. God does not reign because we allow him to. Okay, uh, he is not. He does not reign because we allow him to be on the throne. There's nothing we can do about it. He reigns now. Whether we accept it or whether we not, he still reigns. He reigns over your life. Now, there's a lot of people that says, He don't reign over my life. I'm my own person. He still reigns over your life, whether you like it or not. I uh, heard, heard, heard this guy one time. He said, you know, God said it. I believe it. Therefore, it is. Well, uh, that, that's not 100% true. 
God said it, therefore it is. You, it don't matter whether you believe it or not. Now, yeah, that's a good step to have in there, but whether you believe it or not, it's still true. Whether or not you believe in God, God still reigns. Whether or not you want to think that He has any, anything to do with your life or not, He still reigns. He's still God. He's still established. Um, and, and because of that, He is exalted. Uh, we need to exalt Him. Okay? We need to understand and realize that He reigns, and because of that, worship Him. He doesn't reign because we give Him worship and praise. We should give Him worship and praise because He reigns. And He reigns uh, through His holiness. Um, and, and that's another reason that we, uh, that we need to uh, give Him worship and praise is because of His holiness. Now, when we talk about holiness, holiness, to be holy, means to be set apart. Okay? It, it is to be like no other. It is, it is perfection. It's, it's uncommon. It's nothing common about being holy. Um, there's a lot of things in this world that we consider common. There's a lot of... Uh, we're common. No matter how great you think you are, you're common. Okay? There's nothing... Uh, even if you take somebody who is the world's smartest, you know, Albert Einstein mind, he's still common. He was still a common man. There, he wasn't. He wasn't superhuman. He may. He had. He had a lot of things going on that that made him a genius. That made him. He understood a lot of things. But there was other things he didn't understand. So therefore, he was common. When there, when you talk about holy, holy is separated from the common. It's it's completely different, and that's what God is, and, and not only different but perfect. In every way, not just in one aspect. That's you know, he's not just perfect in that, in that he 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 don't have this kind of desire. He's perfect in everything. He don't make mistakes. You see, you can be you can be somebody who you you can try to clear everything bad out of your life. You can try you can you can go live as a hermit and and separate yourself from from all TV and separate yourself from everybody that would make you angry, everybody that would make you have bad desires or you can separate yourself from everything in this world and somehow something is going to come into your mind that's going to make you sin. Okay? There, there's going to be that you're not perfect. Now you might you might be able to separate yourself from something enough to, to to be perfect in one area of your life, but you'll make a mistake somewhere. That's not God, and 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 for that, so many people they they think of God in human aspects, but He's not. He, we can't even compare him, and that's why that's why it's so hard for us to understand who God is and what He is, is because we try to put Him inside our box. But He's a God that's like nothing else. He is. He don't fit in our human form. He don't fit in our human box. He don't fit in our world. Okay. He's above the world. He holds the world. So therefore, the things that we know and the things that we need and the things that we desire are not the things that He wants and needs and desires. He don't have... His desire is for us to love Him. His need, he has no need. Okay? Uh, and that's, that's why we... He don't need us as humans to serve Him. We don't, we don't have to serve Him. Every other God that, that has been um, created, let's, I guess is the way to, to, to establish them, they, they were created, they were thought up, they were designed by people. Uh, the Greek gods, the Roman gods, uh, the, 
gods like Baal, and they were they were gods that people established, gods that people made up, and for that reason they all falter. They all they all fit into the things of this world. You know, you've got the gods, even the, the, the Indians, the Native Americans, they had the gods of rain god and the sun god and all these different gods. But there's no other god. There's no, there's no true god uh, other than ours. And he's the only one that don't, uh, we don't have to bring him food, we don't have to feed him, we don't have to, to, to do anything for him. Now, we do, he does ask for offerings, he does ask for, for things that we bring before him, but not because he needs them. It's for, there again, it's for our benefit. Listen, when you give to God, it's not, God don't need my money. He don't need me to tithe to this church, okay? If, if, if he so desired, he's, he's got the cattle on a thousand hills. If he so desired, he could just take care of all of our needs once and for all at this church, okay? Well, where would my blessing be in that? Where, where, where would I be blessed in that? Um, therefore, my it's an opportunity that he gives us to give back to him. It's not something that he needs from us. Now, as we go on, um, he loves justice. And, and when we talk about justice, we also... And, and the, the study that I'm looking at, it actually takes its, its uh, scripture out of the HCSB and it, it, it describes fairness and justice with the, uh, in this verse. And as we look at that, fairness and justice, this world seems unfair. Okay? Um, a lot of times, a lot of things in this world seem unfair to us. Um, people that, peop, good people end up with, with bad things happening to them. You know, um, bad people sometimes they it seems like everything goes the right for them, and for that reason we we look around and the world just don't seem very fair sometimes. But God is always fair. Now I say that, but at the same time we look at God and think, how can a fair and just God? allow some of the things in this world to happen. Um, you know, can God forgive a mass murderer? Can God forgive somebody who would harm a child? You know, to me, to me, that's, you know, anybody that would, and, and, I, and I've seen them, you know, people that, that rape and kill children, I... I, you, you won't find any mercy from me on that. You know, I, I know that you know, God, God's merciful, but I, I'm not on some things. And that's one of those things that I, I, I would have the hardest time with. But, but the thing is, is can those people get saved? Can God forgive those people? And, and yes, He can. So, so the question comes is if He is so fair and if He's so just, how can He do that? How can He forgive them? And then the question comes, well, what makes you different than them? Can God forgive you? Can God forgive me? Now, my sin don't seem to me as bad as theirs. But the thing is, it's sin nonetheless. It, it's still a separation from God. And it's still, when you compare holiness to my sin and then their sins here. You know, if, 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 we, if, we, if we could put it on a scale, there's not the biggest separation, near as big a separation between their sin and my sin as there is between God and, and me. Okay? So, we, we look at this and, and yes, God is fair. Now, fairness to what we think of as fair uh, is different than what God sees as fair. 
um, one parable that that sticks out in my mind that I think of when we talk about fairness that just never did really seem fair to me. And it's the, it's the parable that he says, you know, uh, the guy goes out first thing in the morning, he hires his laborers. Well, at, the, at the third hour or the sixth hour, he goes out and he hires more laborers. And then the eleventh hour, he goes out and he hires more laborers. But when pay time came at the end of the day, the guy that came and worked an hour got the same amount that the guy that worked all day. And, and when I think of that, now, any of y'all that's ever worked a job, that just don't seem fair, does it? I've worked 12 hours to get the same amount that somebody gets works for an hour. That just don't seem fair to me. But, when we think of it that way, look, here, here's what Jesus was getting at. I got saved, and I've lived most of my life for Him. So I've got, I've got 42 years in right now of being a Christian. And, and I've been, you know, I, I know that in all those years I've not lived 100% for God. But, you know, I, I've, I've been a Christian. I've lived most of my life for Him. For him. And, and then I know people that have been saved on their deathbed. I mean, they, they were... They, they were breathing their last breath. They were, they were dying. And they called out to God. They will go to the same heaven that I will go to. And, and, and a lot of people, I know a lot of people that struggle with that. And I know a lot of people that have a hard time with that. And I know a lot of people that, that they can't understand that. And they think that God is unfair because of that. They also think that God is unfair because, and, I, and I've, heard, I've talked to people that believe this, God is unfair because my papa was a good man. Never went to church. Never got saved. But he was a good man. He did a lot of good things for people. And if he don't let him into heaven, then God's not fair. People think that. They think that God's not a just God because of that. Listen, God is holy. That's what we've been talking about. God is holy. God is perfect. And if you want to be a Christian, if you, or if you want to get to heaven, and you want to have a relationship with Him, you need to be made holy, which means you need to be made perfect and sinless before you go to meet Him. That can only be done one way. That's through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's the only way we can be made holy to where we can have that relationship with Him. And it don't matter how good you think you've been. It don't matter how, 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 hard, how long you um, have been a good person or, or how many um, things you did for people over your lifetime. If you don't know God, you're not holy. And if you don't accept Jesus, you're not holy. And... and to think that you could earn your way or you think that you think that, that you have deserved it more than somebody else, that's unfair to even think that. God and here's the thing God being holy, He created it, and when you create it, you get to make the rules, which He did. And He made the laws and He established the laws. And all you have to do is follow His rules. Now for those that come later in life, listen, like I said, He established the rules. If they believe in His Son, Jesus Christ, whether they have known Him their whole life or whether they've known Him for an hour, God is merciful. Along with His justice, He is merciful. Now, will they get to go to the same heaven as I do? Yes. Will they still have to stand before His judgment? Yes. Will they be judged for their deeds that they have done? Yes. Now, here's the difference. Because they got saved, they won't be judged for those bad deeds that happened before that. But they won't have any good deeds or anything beyond that to be judged upon. So they won't have much in their crown to lay before His feet. Okay? That's, that's His fairness. That is His fairness. And, and because He is holy... 
He is fair. And He is just. Which means that, that He does punish the evil. We may not see it. There's a lot of people say, well, this, this person, they're evil, they're bad, they're doing all this. And I don't ever see them getting punished. You don't know what's going on in their life. You don't know what, how God is going to deal with them or how God has already dealt with them or what's going to happen later. God rewards and God punishes. In His, you know, we can't always be the right judge, because, but God is. Through His righteousness, through His holiness. And here's another thing. God, through His holiness and His righteousness and His judgment... Justice, he knows the heart as to what you're, and he judges. He judges as much, I believe, on our motivation and what what drives us and what. If we're only, if you're only given to get, or if you're only, if you're only trying to be good to get rewards, God knows that. He knows what's in your heart, and therefore, His righteousness comes through. He always does what is best. He always does what is right. Okay? We don't always see it that way. I know that. I know, I know I, I've, been, I've been one of those that, that have questioned and have wondered about what was right, what was, what was, if it was fair or not. But God knows. And He always does right. Um, and because of that, because of that, because of His holiness, because of His fairness, because of His justice, because of His righteousness, we owe Him our worship. We owe Him, um, we owe Him everything. And, and we don't, like I said, He don't need it. Now, the question comes, the very first part says, let the Lord reign, let the people tremble. Okay? In, in Ecclesiastes, we're told the whole purpose of man is to fear God and keep His commandments. So how, do we, how can we have this relationship and how can we have this worship when, when we are trembling, when we are in fear of Him? And, and that, is, that is a question that comes up a lot, is, is how, how, can we, how can we love Him, and how do, if He loves us so much, why should we tremble, and why should we fear Him? Now, we don't really have a good, uh, a perfect way of describing that, but as a child, I, I, my best way to, to, to think of it is as a child, I loved my parents. Okay? I love my parents. But when I did wrong, I knew what was going to happen. And I was, I, I, I was fearful of what was going to happen. Okay? There was a lot of things in my life that I hoped that my dad didn't find out about. Didn't mean I didn't love him, but I hoped he didn't find out about some stuff. Okay? Uh, but the difference is that God does find out. God does know. And we need to fear Him. Now this fear and trembling is not, a, not the fear like me and snakes, okay? Uh, or some people and spiders. That's not, you're not talking about that kind of fear and trembling. It's talking about a reverence. A reverence type of fear, uh, a, a reverence to where I revere Him and I, and I, I, I won't say anything against Him and I won't do anything against Him and I want to please Him, not because I'm afraid of Him, but because I respect Him and because I, 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 I know He deserves it. That's the kind of fear and trembling that it's talking about. Not, not that I only worship Him because I'm afraid of Him. Okay, not the same kind of, of fear that that people have, you know, in, in certain countries over their dictator. You know, they won't say anything bad against their dictator because they're afraid they'll be killed. That's not why we worship God. That's not why we praise God. We praise Him and worship Him because we revere Him, because we know that He is deserving of it, and because of that, um, because of His holiness. Okay, so first night. We talk is about His holiness. How do we how do we respond to that? 
How, do, how, how does somebody respond to God's holiness? Through our worship, we bow and worship. First of all, we surrender our life to Him. Okay? Because of His holiness. That's the only way we can get close to Him. That's the only way we can have a relationship with Him. Is to surrender our life to Him and then bow and worship. And those are the two ways, those are the, the main ways that we have to respond to God's holiness. Now, if we don't surrender our life to Him and we don't bow and worship, He's still holy. He's still God. He still reigns. But He desires it. He don't need it to be holy, but He desires it because He is. Okay? Anybody have anything else? Uh, he's omniscient. He's omnipresent. 